Okay, I'd like to introduce Riley Hollingsworth, Kilo 4 Zulu Delta Hotel. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, can everybody hear me? Can turn this working okay? I promise you we'll be through by 11.30 as well. No, no more. Yeah, no, wait a minute. Uh, I don't want to interfere with the World Series. All right. I was, uh, I was told to, to be brief, to be informative, and be seated. So I'll try to do that. But when I was putting this stuff together tonight, I ran across uh, some historical timeline points that uh, Rick Roderick, who's president of ARRL, had researched over the years. And he found various uh, developments that were thought at the time to be the end of amateur radio. So I thought I would uh, give you some of these. I thought they were pretty good. A spark gap to Morse code was a, a galactical development, and uh, most people thought that'd be the end of amateur radio. And then in 1952, <coughs> the league promoted a single sideband over the phone mode, and that was thought to be the end of amateur radio. And even when I got licensed in, in 61, there were still lots of arguments over single sideband AM, and the AMers said, that, how can it be a valid? Um, the mode, it doesn't even have a carrier. It sounds like a duck, and it'll be, it'll be the end of amateur radio if you don't have a carrier. Then in 1984, the FCC delegated license testing to volunteer examiner coordinators, and that was thought to be the, amateur, uh, the end of it, amateur radio. But I will tell you on that point, I don't think it helped amateur radio too much, maybe by the numbers, but I noticed that people that took their license, their exam at a in a federal building, uh, remember that day, they know what the weather was, they know where they parked and what they were wearing. It just makes a permanent impression on you, especially if you're a kid. And I don't think you quite get that with the DE program, but all agencies went to that, and uh, it has helped bring in a lot of uh, licensees as the field offices closed. In 1991, the FCC created the no-code technician license, and that was a big uproar that it will be the end of amateur radio, and I still hear that today. In 1998 and uh, 2000, the PSK-31 was developed, and the FCC reduced the amateur radio licenses to three classes, and that was thought to be the end. Now, in 2007, the FCC eliminated the Morse code requirement, uh, and that was thought to be the end of amateur radio. And I remember uh, just before that happened, I had just gotten uh, the job of amateur radio enforcement. And I uh, was transferred from the um, private radio bureau <coughs> over to uh, the enforcement bureau. And we were concerned that the bureau would continue to interfere with the enforcement. They hadn't done much of it, but we didn't want we didn't want them interfering with enforcement and we weren't going to interfere with policy. So I made a trip down to DC and I talked to Bill Cross. And I said, Bill, we're taking over amateur enforcement uh, as agreed, but I want to tell you, uh, we're staying out of policy, but you policy guys and rule makers, you got to stay out of, out of enforcement. And if we're out of each other's hair, we'll do just fine. But I want to tell you one thing. If you do eliminate the Morse code requirement for amateur radio, you're crazy because it's a filter. It keeps out the people who aren't sincerely interested in amateur radio. So Bill just looked at me and said, well, I'll tell you what, you talk to me in six months after you have uh, surveyed your 15 or 20 worst enforcement problems in the United States, and you tell me what class they are. And I said, okay, that's a deal. So over the next six months, um, I pulled field offices on what the problems were, and I uh, went through the boxes of complaints that the FCC had had and never done a damn thing about. And uh, every one of them, were extra class licenses. So Bill and I never had that conversation again about that. It isn't a filter. Uh, and I'll get into that later tonight. Uh, I want to talk to you briefly about uh, these points. What you need to do for amateur radio for to survive the next hundred years. I used to say a thousand, but at the rate we're going, the planet won't even be here then. What can happen if you don't recognize that with every right or privilege comes a responsibility? What's the most dangerous thing that can destroy amateur radio? And what is excellence? What do we look for in the good operator accommodations that we see? And who works for amateur radio? And 
the theory of the big knob and the solar power industry. Believe it or not, I can do all of that in about 20 minutes. Uh, to keep up with the volunteer monitor program, you'll, you'll see the uh, summaries every month in QST. It's on the same page every month, and it uh, tells what we've done. There's a little lead time with the print magazine, but it goes over what we've done in the previous two months. And uh, on the league webpage, you can search for a volunteer monitor program, and you'll have a more accurate survey of what we do every month. I won't go into um, any statistics. I won't bore you with numbers about how we got started and, and how we went through all the applications. But what I want to talk to you about is what I can tell you about amateur radio based on, believe it or not, 60,000 hours of monitoring by the volunteer monitors and the incident reports that they've turned in. Uh, the, the program was, was a huge pain in the neck to set up but it's been much easier than I thought uh, to maintain it. And what has blown me away is that the volunteer monitors report every month, just on HF alone, right around 2,000 hours of monitoring. And we have about 165 volunteer monitors. We had uh, about 175, we lost five to COVID, we lost several to accidents, and a few to, to illness. And so based on 60,000 hours of monitoring, that's uh, from when we started in 2021, uh, or 2020, through the first uh, six months of this year. I'm basing my comments on that. What you need to do for amateur radio basically is lighten up. What we need in amateur radio is a little more kindness and a little more tolerance. Now in our times, we're crazy as hell. That's the nature of our times today. People are crazy, and you can't watch the evening news for a week without realizing that. Um, everyone is more stressed. Uh, the pandemic has loosened all our ties, and we're more likely to break rules when our bonds to society are weakened. We tend to promote our private interest uh, more than usual. And I've seen it at the, the Walmart recently. I saw two people arguing over a parking place and I had some time on my hands, and just out of curiosity, I decided I would see how many vacant parking spaces were available within walking distance. There were 80 available parking places, and these two people were arguing over a parking place that was closest to the door. And I can almost guarantee you that one or both of those probably paid $25 or $50 a month to go to the Y for exercise, but yet they want to park right at the door, and they, they get an argument over a parking space at the Walmart. It's nothing, nothing really makes sense. Uh, we're just in a very odd time for society, and I hope it's a pendulum, I hope it swings, but these are weird times. And uh, when enforcement goes down, particularly on the bands, people tend to relax their commitment to our rules. And it would be just like on the turnpike, if you knew that there was never going to be a state police officer on the turnpike, human nature, you're going to drive different. If you know there might be or there probably would be, you're going to act differently. It's just the nature of, the, of humans. Now, amateur radio joyfully occupies our lives. I think everybody in this room can say that I can't imagine life without amateur radio. And I've often wondered, don't you feel sorry for those people who don't understand and have no clue about the magic of radio? I feel bad for those people. There's no way you can explain it to them. You either understand or appreciate the magic of radio or you don't have a clue. We have to enjoy radio and relish it. But we have to understand that with every privilege comes a responsibility. And the unfettered and unselfish and selfish assertion of privileges will lead to their destruction. Just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean it's right to do it in every circumstance. And technology can change right out from under us in a heartbeat. It's the norm, especially in technology. The only constant is change. Did anybody in this room ever think Sears would go bankrupt? <laughs> uh, did you ever think the landline would be obsolete? Did you ever think you'd be able to view a product on the screen and have it delivered the next day? Not even the next week. I remember in the fourth grade, we got um, at, at Mrs. Plemons in the fourth grade, and she said one day, 
kids, someday you'll be able to see what you're thinking about buying right on a little telephone screen. And you can order it and you won't even have to go in the store. And it'll be sent to your house. So I remember telling my dad that at the dinner table that night. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I think Miss Clemens has a few loose screws rolling around up there. But look at what we can do today. Order something, uh, one day I ordered my 7300, again, it's the second one I've had, but ordered it one day and it came the next. And part of the delight was knowing it's probably gonna be here tomorrow. But even when computers became affordable and weighed less than a ton, could you ever conceive of the internet or sending documents or videos or having large group meetings by Zoom like we're doing tonight? And those of you who are long-term licensees, did you ever think we'd have Echolink or FT8? Both of which have really rejuvenated a lot of amateur operators, regardless of what you think of those modes they have um, activated a lot of amateur radio operators that were sort of just uh, sort of neutral about it and not too active in the hobby. Now, we can take nothing for granted and we must appreciate and be grateful and realize that we have thousands of frequencies and incredible privileges. In fact, we're not even channelized except on one band. Now, maybe it's that we have a lot of these frequencies because they are inherently unstable and nobody's thought of the use for them yet. But that's part of the fun. I remember being at the FCC when we laughed at the prospect of being able to use 800 megahertz for any viable communications. Some years later, they were going for hundreds of millions of dollars for channel segments. Um, nobody has thought of a better use for our frequencies yet, but we must operate as we're demonstrating amateur radio and somebody's listening to us because somebody could walk in with a use for them and we can't rule that out. We have to be sensitive to the nature of our times and we have to understand gratitude. And getting back to the uh, no coders, the problems on our bands aren't from no coders but you'll hear long-term licensees whine about them when in fact they themselves haven't made a CW contact in years. Now, everybody makes mistakes. Nobody gets in trouble in amateur radio by making honest mistakes. There's not an extra in this room, and you tell me if I'm wrong, there's not an extra in this room that hasn't called CQ on a dummy load and wondered why they weren't getting out. They've all done it. There's not an extra in this room who hasn't turned on the transceiver and wondered what went wrong with the audio, only to realize that the headphones were still plugged in from the night before. Now, I did that the other night. I'm in advance, though. I have an excuse. The, um, the problems on the bands aren't from the new licensees. They make honest mistakes, and that's fine. We have to make mistakes to learn and develop. The problems are usually from long-time licensees who think they know everything. They had to draw a cold pitch oscillator on their exam, and they think everybody should have to. And you'll hear them on 75 meters late at night and late in the afternoon on 7200. And we'll get it uh, slowly but surely. They don't like newcomers, and they use a kilowatt to talk across the state to the same people night after night. It's their net. And they've never tried anything new in amateur radio. They haven't tried anything else not even 17 meters. And in fact, they haven't really done any real amateur radio in decades. But they'll criticize the new licensees. But unlike previous times in the amateur radio service, they won't take any of their time to help them. They won't go out of their way to help them. They run out of things to talk about, <clears throat> certainly aren't having any technical discussions. So invariably, opinions start to be expressed, and then arguments ensue, and it goes downhill from there. They complain about it, but they do it night after night. They use thousands of dollars of equipment to act like delinquents. And CW doesn't have that problem, I know, this uh, Narga contest. And they'll complain about interfering with each other. And they'll say, this has been going on for months and months, or a year. And I'm thinking, why don't you just turn dial and go to another frequency? I mean, if you, if you had five different ways of getting to work every morning. And one of those routes, you always got a rock through your windshield. Seems like sooner or later you realize you ought to just take the other four routes and not worry about them. They don't remember what Edward R. Murrow, the famous news commentator said. 
He said, just because your voice can be heard around the world doesn't mean you're any wiser than when it can only be heard down to the end of the bar. And that they just don't realize that. I can't, I can't tell you the number of times while at FCC I heard arguments on 75 meters about who was causing interference pointing fingers, arguing, when in fact we knew from simultaneous monitoring that the interference was coming from a haywire foreign broadcast station or a defective wave height, these are actual cases, a defective wave height measuring machine in the Gulf of Mexico that MIT operated, or a magnetic resonant energy therapy machine in Indiana. 80% of all interference is unintentional. And we have a responsibility not to destroy our bands or aggravate ourselves with that. We're all in this together. If we have any appreciation and gratefulness for amateur radio and the privileges we have. And as I said earlier, if there's anything that can destroy amateur radio, it's the microphone. It's not FTA, it's not the internet, it's not texting, it's not uh, WhatsApp, it's the microphone. Coupled with an ungrateful attitude for what we have. Now getting to, uh, you'll notice that in addition to advisories, we send out good operator commendations. And we, we look for, uh, you've seen a fair number of those. And they go to, uh, they've gone to net controls who week after week run nets or encourage newcomers or teach them the procedures. Um, operators who relinquish a frequency even when they were there first. Those who seek out new licensees and help them understand amateur radio and teach classes and teach them the best methods. And by the way, it's been said of teachers, and we have some in this room, teachers may very well be immortal because no one knows when or even if their influence ever ends. And that's what keeps amateur radio going, is those willing to teach amateur radio the newcomer. And these operators uh, and teachers demonstrate that uh, they demonstrate excellence. And we define excellence as caring more than others think wise, risking more than others think safe, dreaming more than others think practical, and expecting more than others think possible. And it's obvious from seeing your club today and what you've done since the tornado that you have a number of these people in the club. Now as to this last element, uh, if there's a net or a group that regularly acts very irresponsibly or that really is an embarrassment to amateur radio, if you have a friend or neighbor in the shack listening, cut them loose. Just don't participate. I've had to do that for several nets that I used to like checking into on 75 meters, but it got a little bit raw, a little bit of an embarrassment. You've got to be part of the solution and not the problem. I mean, think about it. What kind of service do we have if you're nervous demonstrating it? And when the FCC first got back into amateur radio after 12 years of neglect, uh, which they had to do because they didn't have the staff and you had the cable TV explosion, the land mobile explosion, and uh, trunking and so forth. Uh, amateur radio was an embarrassment. And, and many, many people were, were scared to demonstrate it. They wanted to, but they were afraid to demonstrate it to a friend or a neighbor or, or one of their nephews or grandkids. We have to understand our legacy and we have to pay it forward and expect, and this is the key point, expect nothing less from our peers. And it all comes down to the theory of the big knob. It's an idiot filter. Most of the problems on the bands can be solved by one party just moving the big knob a few kilograms. I've got a whole stack of old Allied and Lafayette radio catalogs from the 60s. And I was looking through those a few months ago. And then, of course, I know about the HRO and the DX engineering catalogs. But I noticed that what all transceivers in there, even the flex is available, but what all the equipment in there has in common is one big knob. And they didn't just run out of little knobs, they put a big knob on there deliberately so that it'd be the easiest to do, change the frequency, and that'll solve a, a lot of problems. Now finally, I have three closing points that are very important, I think. Number one, now, who works for who around here? I noticed that, uh, and I want to I make it clear, this is not an advertisement or a solicitation, but it's an honest observation that I noticed it. Uh, for 23 years uh, after I changed to amateur radio enforcement and since I retired, what organization 
or what entity, what firm, or other group represents amateur radio before Congress and for the FCC. Nobody does. Nobody does except the ARRL. You don't have big law firms or lobby groups coming in advocating for amateur radio. We have no advocates except the league. Uh, no organization has our interest anymore. Uh, no, nobody advocates for us before the FCC except the league. And you need to understand that point. And ignore it or take it for granted at your peril. But to the extent the league flourishes with membership and we have strength in numbers, if we don't have that, if our membership starts going down, we're dead in the water. Another caution I want to throw out is that, you know, people ask me over the years, uh, would the computer and the internet harm amateur radio or destroy it? Of course it hasn't. Each has enhanced the other. But use the internet all you want, but make sure your station can operate if everything gets hacked, as it does more and more. I used to bring articles about the internet coming down. I don't have to, it's in the paper every week now. But operate, and make sure it can operate if the whole internet goes down. Because the internet is as fragile as it is convenient as fun, but make sure you can operate without it. Otherwise, where it's falling across the internet, and we lose our fail-safe strong point. And that's our strongest point. Now, this final point is, I think, as important as the others. And the league says, the lab at the league, says that in the next few years, interference from solar power devices and solar uh, charging fields will far outnumber power line interference cases. And we're gonna have to deal with that. The IEEE has, has just finished, the draft has been sent for voting, a three-year project working with the power companies on ways to approach radio frequency interference to amateurs and others from power lines. And there were some very big power companies on the, on the committee, and uh, they, were, they were ham operators. And they worked splendid, they had great ideas, and, and what this standard does is tell all the power companies what equipment they need, which is very little equipment, and what they don't need, and how to locate radio frequency interference to amateurs coming from a power line or a device on a power line or down a power line somewhere. The uh, cost of equipment to, to successfully locate interference to amateur radio stations for a power company costs less than two men in a bucket truck for a day. And the power companies are learning this. Now here's the thing. The lab at the ARRL says that in the next few years, RFIs over here, solar power industry interference is gonna be the big thing. And my point is they don't know us like the power line industry does. The solar power industry is new. The players are new. Probably some of those members of the solar power industry don't know what amateur radio is. And so what wakes me up at three o'clock in the morning is if we were to get in a dispute with the solar power industry and go to a subcommittee before Congress and one of the, power, the solar power players says, well, we don't know why you want to protect amateur radio. This is what we hear on amateur radio. <coughs> and they play some of this stuff that goes on at 75 meters at night or 7,200 in the afternoon. That's what I'm attacking, trying to keep that tamp down to 1%. That would be a great embarrassment, and to me it would be, it would be game over. Now, the good news is uh, the league has worked very successfully with the solar power industry so far, and Solar Edge, one of the players, has a phenomenal record of solving uh, interference that these uh, residential installations of solar panels on the roof cause. Uh, there's an optimizer on there and a few other devices that really tear the hell out of amateur radio. Solar Edge will send a technician out because they're working with the league and Ed Hare cooperating with the industry. They'll send a technician out on individual cases to fix that house installation. It's just, it's phenomenal. It's, we've never had that cooperation from anybody. But there's a lot of different companies in the solar power industry, and they're going to come and go, they're going to uh, buy and be sold and merge, and for the most part, they don't know a lot about amateur radio. 
So that's why we have to be on our, our best behavior and not embarrass ourselves and think about that all of these great privileges we have and what we have to do to protect them. There's every, with every, with every right, every privilege comes a responsibility. And we have to realize that the billions of dollars of spectrum that we're sitting on. And the FCC is slow enough as it is, they're usually 10 years behind the curve. And we don't want them throwing up their hands saying, well, there's, there's not a lot we can do about the solar power industry's interference to amateur radio. And once again, the league will be a leader in that. And uh, Ed Hare and the fellow that works with him now that uh, replaced Mike Gruber, they work directly with Solar Edge and some of these bigger companies. And uh, it's just amazing what they've, been, what they've been able to accomplish. So we have to do our part by being, having our best foot forward on the amateur bands. And beyond that, I would say thanks for inviting me and just get out there and enjoy amateur radio. And uh, it is a joyful avocation. Thank you. Take any questions and Benny will give the answers. <laughs> are, here? are there any actual regulations that the solar power companies have to uh, abide by or adhere to in respect to interference? Well, specifically not to solar power, but they're bound under Part 15 okay. not to admit so much radiation. But the optimizer, and, and the good news is, I just found out the other day, these huge and I'm surprised at this. These huge solar fields, you call it 50 acres, 100 acres, or more, they don't cause interference to amateur radio. It's some of the devices on the rooftop installations, and there's a device called an optimizer that apparently, in some of the larger residential installations, if, if part of the uh, solar panel is under cloud cover, not in direct sun, the optimizer ramps up those cells that are in the direct sun. And that tears the hell out of amateur radio frequencies. And there's another device on there that, uh, that causes a lot of trouble to amateur radio, but it's easily fixed, easily repaired at the installation. And um, Ed here has this idea to um, work with the solar power industry so that they have little meters and detectors that after they put this rooftop installation on, they can go over it and see if there's any interference that shouldn't be there and fix it very inexpensively right on the spot before they leave, before the installation is complete. And if that works, that'll, that, that'll be a miracle. It'll be a great development for us. Because solar power is the, I, I don't need to tell you that uh, it's the way of the future. And the, the, um, we finally got power line interference basically solved it after how many years? 50. And we can't, we can't do it that way in the solar power. Uh, I wanted to ask you if there have been any changes in the way Part 15 is administered and enforced, uh, especially with regard to imported equipment, consumer equipment. I, I don't know, but I know that I see complaints every week about things being sold and marketed on the internet. Uh, that aren't supposed to be under Part 15. And we report it to the FCC. They keep uh, meticulous records of it. And uh, periodically, you'll read of some company being slammed for that. I think the last one I remember was the uh, TV drones that uh, were tearing up the amateur bands. In fact, the league filed that complaint, I think. But um, that's a direct interference complaint. There's lots of marketing complaints. Uh, amplifiers being marketed to cover the CD bands and so forth. I had I saw one of those the other day, and we sent them to to the FCC, and they track them. And the hammer eventually comes down. Anybody else in here? Anybody? Aren't the uh, LED light bulbs also responsible for a lot they of They cause uh, interference.